Well, I'm excited. Love baptisms. So we remember my own, but I love baptisms and uh, just the, the joy of watching people uh, identify themselves with Christ in a public way, sharing something of their testimony and, uh, and obeying Jesus and going through the waters of baptism. It is just beautiful. And we sing, uh, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Let me tell you, Dale, you got changed, mate. If anybody wants to get baptised, you know, after the sermon, Dale is ready to go again, okay? So, seriously, well, you know, don't know if he is or not, I didn't ask him, but... If today the Spirit's talking to you about following Jesus, then today is the day you need to respond. If part of that is giving your life to Christ then today is the day you need to respond. If part of that is, uh, is, is baptism, then today is a good day to respond. If it's something else that the Spirit of God is talking to you about, today is a good day to respond. It's like I, I looked over this direction as we were singing that last song and here is little Pippa sitting on, or lying on a mum's lap like singing these words so beautifully out loud. And guess what? Unlike me and you, she doesn't need to look at the screen. Whether she can read it, I don't know, but probably can. But it's like she knows the words. And, and, and the, the look on her face was like, I not only know these words, these words are meaningful to me. We need to come to Jesus as little children. Sometimes I think we can uh, come to Jesus um, a, bit like, a bit like, anyone ever heard of the term Facebook Pharisee? That's good, because I made it up. I, <laughs> I, I, I thought someone might have made it up before me, I don't know. But it's like, Facebook Pharisee. That's like, it's, it's, it's not the only place, I'm sure, but it's, it's one of the places where you can shame people and put forward information that is just trash. And, and, but also, when we, you have discussions about stuff, people like shame people and, and ridicule the person more than the idea. And... and People spread stuff. It's like it's a bit like COVID. It, it, like it, it spreads. It gets contagious, and it seems to go from one to the other to the other to the other. I uh, I happened to notice yesterday a thing on Facebook. I hope no, if anyone's put it up here, so that's all right. Sorry. Um, I don't know who it came from. Can't remember. But it was this great picture of of a field full of cars, overgrown grass, older cars, all look pretty similar, the cars that is, and uh, it had on it something like, um, field full of cars, electric cars in France, which obviously, no or something like that, which nobody wants to buy. You know, the implication, what a way to trash electric cars are. Well, my limited understanding is electric cars in Europe are going pretty well, not so much in Australia, but whatever, but in Europe going pretty well. I said, oh, well, I thought, okay, let's just do a search on this. As it turns out, that photo has got nothing to do with electric cars and it has nothing to do with France. But it, it creates a life of its own. It's a bit like a, a Facebook Pharisees where we, we, we create this truth and we expect everybody else to believe it and to follow it. There, there, there was a dead car yard in China, if you want to know, and it was posted by some Instagram years ago, whatever. But now it's be suddenly become electric cars in France. <laughs> Go figure. Um, but we see it so often. And we can easily like, shame people as well as um, issues without knowing the facts. 
And certainly we can do that by, uh, by seeking to blame and shame people with so-called authority. It's what the uh, Pharisees were doing, hence uh, Facebook Pharisees. Like they might have been the ones in their day who were putting stuff out there, which wasn't of the scriptures, putting stuff out there to, to uh, bring shame and to blame people who weren't upholding whatever they felt to be upholded and to project things that weren't true. If you want to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 9, we're going to read a few verses and have a short message. John chapter 9. I just want to, I was going to read the whole chapter, but I'm not. Because, like Pippa, you too can read. But you can't read the first seven. That's why I'm reading them, okay? As he went along, Jesus, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of God, of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. I am the light of the world. I am the light in the world, sorry. And I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Um, like this, uh, like they say, who sinned? And this was something that had been promoted by the Facebook Pharisees. Who sinned? But this guy, this, this guy's born blind, so obviously someone's to blame. Who sinned? Might have been him. Or his parents. The, the message translation or Bible... Um, Sometimes really good, sometimes probably not. It's not a translation as such, it's a bit of a paraphrase. But I love the way it paraphrases uh, verse 3, etc. He says, you're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. Instead, look for what God can do. And I think, wow, that just expresses it so well and I think grabs the essence of what the NIV said when I read that. It's like, uh, you know, who's to blame? You know, he or his, his parents? No, let's see what God is going to do. Let's look for what God can do in this circumstance. And... If you read the rest of the story and encourage you to do so, you, you see this, this um, summary of, uh, of this passage. This guy who was woke up that morning blind, went to bed that night with very clear vision, not just physically, but also spiritually. And you read the account of what he went through on that day. But you see this, this truth that comes out of it. That's why he did what Jesus said, and then he said what Jesus did. And we've had Rachel and Lauren and Stephen come up here today, always, you know, if you get into even more detail, no doubt, very, very different testimonies. And we could go around this room. And, and, uh, and share some testimonies of our lives, I'm sure, and all probably very different. But we, but we need to ensure that we do as Jesus said. Uh, these three up here talked about how they, 
how they gave their life to Jesus. And Jesus calls us. He told his disciples, and going down to us, go and make other disciples. And he calls us to, in repentance and faith, follow him. And so we see uh, Rachel and uh, Lauren and Stephen do that. And we see something of today, not only that they, they shared today of what God did. Like how he's impacted their life, how he's changed their life. And what he's doing in their life and expect him to do in the future. And how they're going to continue to obey and submit and serve. And that's all like this beggar who was blind, who could now see. It's like he did what Jesus said. And then he said what Jesus did. I can imagine, not being blind maybe, but it's like this, this person comes up to you, spits in the dirt, wants to mix it up and stick it on your eyes, like I, you might tell them where they could, what they could do with it. Like Jesus didn't need to do that, he could have just said, be healed, see. But for whatever reason, he, uh, he did that. And this, 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 this man who was blind from birth, but blind at the beginning of the day, like he could now see. And, and he went through the rest of that day. He had that mud on his eyes and Jesus told him to go wash it in the pool of Siloam. And he did and he could see. We ha often see that with Jesus, that he uh, will, will tell people to go and do something. Remember the ten lepers? Uh, you know, they eventually got up the courage, I think, like, what do we got to lose? Jesus, help us. And he said, go and talk to the, the guys down at the temple. It's like, oh, yeah, big deal. Um, that was certainly the people who had the authority to declare you not having leprosy anymore. But it's like, well, you know, you could have healed us. Uh, but again, maybe they got together and they, they decided, well, what do we got to lose? And so we see as they went, they were healed. It's like, do what Jesus said. What's Jesus saying to you and to I? Look, we have this statement we've used. Like more people, more like Jesus. We've seen something of that here today, like the outward expression of it. We have this, I hate to tell you, but we have this like goal of how many baptisms we're going to have this year. Well, we finally started. I haven't quite got to the goal yet, but, you know, uh, you know it's, it's like it's an identifying and it's a measurable thing of like more people becoming more like Jesus. Next week we have... Uh, uh, we have uh, at least one uh, child dedication. That's another way of getting more people. <laughs> uh, and we have a child dedication, but we also have the commissioning of Andrew and Andrew and encourage you to be here for, for those uh, couple of events. It's like, because we're with Andrew and Andrew, uh, it's like part of our, our planning more people more like Jesus. Like we see the result but also we're, sort of, we're stepping forward in faith and expanding the role that Alison's being fulfilled, uh, fulfilling that role, but also creating new ones, better than expanding, creating new ones uh, as well, so that we're planning more people more like Jesus. What's God asking you to do? Maybe it's step one. Repent and faith Lord Jesus I'm a sinner I've fallen short just like everybody else in this room but I've fallen short and I need you and I thank you that 2,000 plus years ago or thereabouts you paid the price on the cross for me It's faith.
Not, I can be good enough. Not, I've got a family heritage of Christendom. Not, I'm just white Anglo-Saxon born in Australia. Uh, but, I'm a sinner. And I need saving. And Jesus wants to save. Maybe Jesus is asking you step one. Maybe you, you've, Jesus is asking you other things. Maybe he's asking you to take up this particular ministry. Maybe he's asking you to make sure you're tired. Maybe he's asking you to make sure you're on the front line being that witness in show and tell the gospel in, uh, in your workplace or in your school or university or wherever it may be. Maybe he's asking you to be baptised. Maybe whatever. What's he asking you? Maybe he's asking you to give up something. Not for Lent, for life. Maybe he's asking you to give up that addiction which is of no value at all. It's in fact dragging you down like we talked about a number of weeks ago. Those things that tangle and weigh us down. Some we might not see directly as sin but they're slowing our walk down with Jesus because they're heavy to carry. Maybe Jesus is asking you to give up or to take that step. What's Jesus asking of you? Now let me tell you, sometimes it's not easy. Read the story of this man. And you see, you know, he was pulled aside by the powers that be. And, um, and he was questioned. They didn't believe him. They get your parents, we don't believe you. He's a grown man. Get your parents, we don't believe you, blah, 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 blah. And, and then he came and his parents came and, and there was this, this pushback. He was, he was bullied, we'd probably put it in today's terms. He was bullied by these people in authority and yet what did he do? Initially, he did what Jesus said and then he just said what Jesus did. talked to uh, one of these three this morning who got up here and shared even this morning as they were preparing to come well still in bed a spiritual attack occurred there's pushback but this blind beggar who was now seeing but there was pushback there was there was the the um, the bullying there was the spiritual warfare that goes on so you try to take the steps of faith with jesus you try to do the right thing or stop doing the things that you shouldn't be doing and to be the character of jesus become more like jesus and you will see pushback but we need to do as what jesus said And then say what Jesus did. Look, it sounds so simple. But sometimes it's difficult when you have uh, pushback from family, pushback from workmates, pushback from friends. It's not easy. I can remember soon after becoming a Christian, I was uh, sharing a, a unit in Sydney. Just moved to Sydney after I became a Christian and began by sharing a unit with my best friend. Uh, he was my best friend at uni. We both moved to Sydney for work, different employers, but uh, we shared a unit. And, and uh, it's like, I didn't remember this, but it's like, did what Jesus said, now I've got to say what Jesus did. So I shared with him uh, my faith. I shared with him what Jesus did. In hindsight, the way I did it, was not good it's like something like you know some people get away with it my personality probably wouldn't it's like you're not a christian you're going to hell 
It's like, well, maybe not the best approach that Ian should have used with my mate Robert. Um, the principle was right. The mode was perhaps not spirit-led. And sadly, he moved out very quickly. And the friendship was gone. So we need to be seeking the spirit in, in saying what he did. Certainly this, this chapter in this passage of uh, John chapter 9, um, he, he was confronted by the powers that be and he shared what Jesus wa- did and, and they became angry, apart from bullying, they became angry. They, uh, they said, what would you know? You're just a blind beggar. We are a disciple of Moses after all. Well, I think about that and I think, um, I'm not sure Moses ever asked the disciples. He pointed people to God. Um, I do know Moses listened to God. But if you read the Gospels, interesting. God listened to Jesus. So who do you follow? You follow Jesus. God in the flesh. And in our relationships, um, we need to be like Jesus said, I am the light of the world here. It's like he's, he's shining a torch on relationships. He's shining a torch into the darkness of the world. And he calls us also, he says, you are the light of the world. It's like we need to be speaking truth into situations. Truth into relationships. Truth into issues. Sadly, you know, you know, I'm no expert and, and I don't know truth about a lot of the issues going on in the world. And truth be known, you aren't either. But we share um, things that maybe, uh, you know, we've just picked up from somewhere or we, we, we believe because we get fed what we believe. Be careful. But when there's things of the scriptures, we, we have a great test and we need to be the light in the darkness in relationships and in other situations in the world where we can be that light and we can share truth. And when we share truth, we need to remember we do what Jesus said and then we watch him work. We invite Jesus to do something in terms of the message. What did it say? Instead, look for what God can do. And then we share what Jesus did. Let's pray.